Welcome again. Right now we're at Acts chapter 21, verses 27, all the way through to Acts chapter 22, verse 29. We're going to be talking about riot in the temple and how Paul was arrested and how he tried to defend himself. Now, we just came from the previous passage where Paul proved to the world, at least he did his best, to prove to the world that he's not against Torah, that he's not against the law of God. And then he didn't teach others against Torah either, but that he himself walks justly and righteously in the law of God and that he teaches others to do likewise. And if you haven't listened to the previous session, you need to listen to the previous session. And you also need to listen to taking Paul's letters in context, Paul and the Nazarite vow, and the passage in Acts chapter 15 entitled Gentiles Enter Torah. If you didn't listen to those three other teachings, you need to stop right here and listen to them because this is the context that we're in. Paul is just wrapping up his Nazarite vow here. And not only did he go with the Torah and did he observe the Torah strictly, according to Numbers chapter 6, but he also observed the Torah strictly according to the book of Leviticus in regards to seven days of consecration. So this is where we're coming in right now. Paul just finishing up his Nazarite vow plus serving his time of seven days of consecration. Here we are, Acts chapter 21 verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the multitude and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple." This is what happens a lot of the times. There are a lot of false accusations that come against the true people of God. Because you see, you stir up the people. You stir up the sinners. You stir up the people who don't understand. And, and they don't know what to do with themselves. So they convince themselves of things that are just not true. It's not true that Paul was teaching people against the Torah against the customs of the Jews, and against the holy place. That's just not true. It's also not true that Paul brought Trophimus, the Ephesian, into the temple. That's just not true. And apparently these Jews didn't know that Paul just finished up the Nazarite vow, okay? The most holy, the epitome of Torah observance. So they ignorantly falsely accused him of all these things. Verse 30, all the city was moved and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. Immediately the doors were shut. As they were trying to kill him, news came up to the commanding officer of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Immediately he took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. They, when they saw the chief captains and the soldiers, stopped beating Paul. Then the commanding officer came near, arrested him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and inquired who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another among the crowd. When he couldn't find out the truth because of the noise, he commanded him to be brought into the barracks. When he came to the stairs, he was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he asked the commanding officer, May I speak to you? He said, Do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who before these days stirred up to sedition and led out into the wilderness the 4,000 men of the assassins? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. I beg you, allow me to speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the stairs, beckoned with his hands to the people. When there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, listen to the defense which I now make to you. Two points here. He respectfully addressed his accusers. He called them brothers 
and fathers. Why did he call them brothers and fathers? Because they were Jewish, just like he was. And number two, he said, listen to the defense that I will make. Because you see, in many circumstances like this, a lot of people do not listen, okay? They speak without listening. People, you know, just assume that they know when they didn't even listen. You know, the book of Proverbs says that you are a fool if you speak before you hear, okay? So Paul said, listen to the defense which I now make to you. When they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they were even more quiet. He said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. Very important that he mentioned the name of Gamaliel because Gamaliel was a very well-respected, very well-known Jewish rabbi, Jewish leader of his day. Gamaliel, a leader in the school of Hillel. So Paul said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia and brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, instructed according to the strict tradition of the law of our fathers, the Torah, being zealous for God, even as you all are today. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders testify, from whom also I received letters to the brothers and traveled to Damascus to bring them also who were there to Jerusalem in bonds to be punished. As I made my journey, I came close to Damascus about noon. Suddenly a great light shone around me from the sky. I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. Notice here that Jesus is true to his word in Matthew chapter 25, where he says, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. He takes it personal. You might say, oh, this person, you know, he is just a, you know, an unlearned person. You know, you might be attacking people because of their approach in the gospel, preaching the gospel, because of their belief, because of their doctrine. You better be careful because you might be opposing Jesus himself, okay? So be very careful. You might be persecuting Jesus himself. Notice Jesus said, what you do to the least of these, my brothers, you do to me. What did he mean by brothers? Well, first and foremost, he meant the Jewish people. Also, the believers in him. He calls them all brothers, okay? So be careful. Verse 9, those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they didn't understand the voice of him who spoke to me. Now, it's also a significant thing to understand that this here is also recorded in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we're told about Paul's experience on the road to Damascus, and it differs slightly from this account. It's important to know how it differs and why it differs. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details here. I encourage you to go back to our session in Acts chapter 9 where I deal with this, but be aware of what you are reading here. You are reading a letter from Luke, okay? You're not reading the book of Isaiah. You're not reading the book of Jeremiah. You're not reading a book written by an established prophet per se. You're reading a book that was written by Luke to another person. You're reading a private message, okay? So Luke wasn't very, you know, legalistic, specific, that he made sure that everything lined up. Generally, it's the same, okay? But Luke never thought that this book, the book of Acts, would actually get into the hands of billions of people. He never thought that. He wrote it to a private audience, and he never thought of it getting any further. He never thought of it ever being considered to be the Word of God. So take it for what it is. But having said that, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Verse 10, I said, what shall I do, Lord? He said, Arise and go into Damascus. There you will be told about all things which are appointed for you to do. When I couldn't see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus, one Ananias, a devout man according to the law. Notice, 
Paul specifically made it clear that he praised people for their obedience, for their observance of Torah, okay? Paul made it very clear that he respected people for their obedience to Torah. Today, if Christians were obedient to Torah, another Christian might come up and say, oh no, we're not supposed to go by Torah no more. They're not respectful. They're not saying, oh, you're a devout man. They attack them using Paul's letters. On a side note, a lot of these Christians that use Paul's letters to support their antinomianism don't realize that those letters were written before the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 21, after Paul was confronted by the disciples, by the apostles, after he was put to the test and warned not to teach anybody against Torah, he changed his tone in his latter letters. One Ananias, Paul made it very clear, a devout man according to the Torah, well reported of by all Jews who lived in Damascus, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, Brother Shaul, receive your sight. In that very hour, I looked up at him. Now, I said this before, but once again, I'll say this. The term at that very hour doesn't necessarily mean like how we are today. We're so picky, so legalistic. It doesn't mean in those 60 minutes, okay? The term at that very hour means at that moment, okay? It just means at that moment. So in that very hour, at that moment, I looked up at him. He said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. Notice here that Paul only at this point saw the righteous one. All the other disciples, all the other, you know, the 12, they were walking with him. They were talking with him for a number of years, okay? So Paul was a babe in the faith. He was a babe in the doctrine, okay? Don't forget that. Peter, James, and John has seniority on Paul. Verse 15, for you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you wait? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When I had returned to Jerusalem, and while I prayed in the temple, I fell into a trance, and I saw him saying to me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not receive testimony concerning me from you. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue those who believed in you. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the cloaks of those who killed him. He said to me, Depart, for I will send you out far from here to the Gentiles. They listened to him until he said that. Then they lifted up their voice and said, Rid the earth of this fellow, for he isn't fit to live. Now, it's really too bad they didn't let Paul continue. They didn't let Paul, you know, tell the whole story. They interrupted him. And that's typical of people when you're talking about religious things. They don't want to hear. They stick their fingers in their ears. Like I said before, the book of Proverbs says, if you answer a matter before you hear the whole thing, it's foolishness. It's a folly and a shame to you, okay? Listen to it all before you comment. So a big question is, what would Paul continue to say? What would he go on to say? You know, I believe according to the previous chapter, he would go in and continue his discourse into how he is Torah observant, how they're not correct in their false accusations, how he didn't bring a Greek into the temple, how he was completely in compliance with the Torah and he taught other people the same way and how that he was misunderstood and how that he proved this by taking the Nazarite vow and sponsoring four other men in doing so, which could have drained him of all his resources. Verse 23, as they cried out, threw off their cloaks and threw dust into the air, the commanding officer commanded him to be brought into the barracks, ordering him to be examined by scourging that he might know for what crime they shouted against him like that. When they had tied him up with thongs, Paul asked the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and not found guilty? Notice, Paul didn't turn the other cheek here, okay? 
He defended himself. He just didn't allow them just to beat him up. Then he's like, listen, it's not lawful to, for you to do that. He fought back. Verse 26, when the centurion heard it, he went into the commanding officer and told him, watch what you're about to do for this man is a Roman. The commanding officer came and asked him, tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commanding officer answered, I bought my citizenship for a great price. Paul said, but I was born a Roman. Immediately, those who were about to examine him departed from him, and the commanding officer also was afraid when he realized that he was a Roman because he had bound him. So don't forget to seek God with all your heart, and if you do, you will find him. Call upon him, and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.